Well, welcome to Cella Nivea here in the Julian Alps. A couple of little checks on the consistency and solidity of the snow here this morning. Very difficult conditions for the organisers to manage, but uh, I have to say the local organising team here have done a great job in preparing the piece. It's uh, a very steep finish pitch, short run to the finish there, just the last three gates on the flat section. And uh, we can be sure that this culmination of the 2024 winter season uh, brought to you on FIS TV will be a thriller, no question about that. Yo, uh, uh, yo, uh, check, 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 check. Mom. Uh, yeah, I hear you. Uh, no, Uh, yes, wait it.
Well, welcome everybody to Fist TV once again. We're with John Clark and we're in Sela Nevea. We're here for the World Cup finals of uh, the Para Alpine season. This 2024 season has been beset with problems, mainly weather related. Uh, calendar's been shifted more or less on a daily basis. And uh, this week's events, these final competitions of the 24 winter, um, are no different. Many program changes will bring you up to date with those as the next few days uh, competitions progress. But the good news is we have decent weather today for our opening giant slalom of this broadcast program. And uh, a, a difficult hill, I would say, uh, having worked on this uh, mountain before, I can assure you it is a very, a very changeable pitch, changing pitches, changing gradients, um, a characteristic of this slope that adds to the difficulty for the skiers. We're seeing a giant slalom competition uh, in taking part today. And uh, just while we make final preparations here in Italy, camera men are getting into position but uh, the weather as you can see on screen rather damp not actually raining at the moment but a band of thin mist stuck in the trees across the middle part of the coast that shouldn't cause too much of a problem for the competitors today um, but as I've said uh, warm weather and soft snow conditions resulting from that high higher than average temperatures causing a bit of a headache for the organisers. We've actually had to cancel the downhill, a high-speed event, so unfortunately we won't uh, be able to bring you that this week. But we have Giant Slalom, Slalom combined and a Super G on the schedule. A message there that uh, is very ready to race, that's for sure. Let's start with her coaches. Women's visually impaired category is the first that we'll bring you this morning. And uh, those of you are familiar with uh, the skiing, the skier ski with a guide. Uh, uh, the guide wears a high vis but the main link is obviously the visual link isn't really there for the visual impaired skiers. The main link is via the Bluetooth headset. Three categories, three classifications, visually impaired standing athletes and sitting athletes. So the three main divisions. This is the start list for the women's sitting category. And uh, good party of the nations, very broad representation. The men, of course, uh, the same three categories, the VI skiers, visually impaired skiers on your screen there. And again, we have uh, a strong field of standing athletes. First to close out will be, uh, I would say, one of the favorites, Artur Boucher on the French team. But uh, as this season has shown, guys in, the, in this particular division are extremely competitive so it, 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 this race won't be over until later this afternoon. It's a two run event remember so first run sets up the start order for the next competition, the next run rather which will bring you noon at, at GMT or one o'clock local time and then the final category headed by Jesper Peterson. I would say he's the favourite, not the out and out favourite, because again, practically every page here, Yero and Hampshire, definitely a contender here today, but the, the men's sitting division, that'll be really hotly contested as well. So just a couple of moments until we get first racers in the start gate. Here we go, long shot showing uh, Veronica Eigner and her sister, Elizabeth, who, yeah, her, it's a little bit uncertain, her name, uh, Elizabeth's name wasn't on the start list today, but, yeah, there's Veronica, tour leader bib, it's been a standout season for her, hasn't missed a beat, clear, victor, 
straight victories all the way through the season. And we're underway here in Sela Nevea. So again, hats off to the organisers. Let's just have a look at these early runners to see how the peace conditions are. Quite soft in some parts, but where the salt, where the chemicals have been applied well, then it looks pretty firm to me. So the argument is there's a nice steady pace. Nothing too hurried about their skiing at the moment. Don't get me wrong, this is a this will be a pace setting run. Look at just looking a little uncertain there coming through the transition. As I say, there's a lot of terrain here, and particularly for the visually impaired athletes. So course inspection is uh, crucially important. Onto the final pitch now. Heading down this real steep bank that brings them down towards the finish area and it's bumpy. Ripples there left from the, the course preparation work. Flattening off now, they can relax now safely the over the line. Close together there, 57.25. The pace setting time for the first competitors now. Tina Vodza, the local favourite here, and her guys. We saw them in the start area. They're definitely ready to rock. Pushing hard here. The checkpoint coming up just as they drop into this gully where the piece sweeps across to the skier's right. And we should have a split time just in a moment from now here. This next red gate checkpoint, 1.56 the gap between Vodza and our Austrian leaders. Very good guide in there. Information about the snow and how the who is running. It's uh, doing well, pushing forward, getting the weight towards the front of the skis to deal with these bumps, tucking now for the line, strong, strong finish, 3.77. Lenya doing a good job with the guiding there, so second pair safely down to the finish. And there's Alexander Kretsova for Slovakia. The Eigners have had a clean run of things really this season in giant slalom and slalom. But uh, the competition are hard on their heels, so this is by no means a foregone conclusion. Just watching very closely here as the split time passes. Only 77 hundreds here. So we're working well. A solid rhythm, moving from foot to foot, pushing the weight forward real close to the gates there, pushing the, the risk level as well. Final pitch here, steepest section of the course, safely negotiated, a straight run now for the finish. Guide an athlete, and crossing the line, 3.47, that's good enough for second place, very tight between second and third. No threat to the Eigners right now. So our lone Korean skier in the women's VI category, Sarah Choi, with her guide now on course. Good work there. Just a little tentative looking and the weight getting back and oh, the first crash of the day. Oh, it's a... Uh, an orthodox role of, for the guide there, managing to catch his athlete as she was sliding uh, sliding down towards him. But that uh, looks to be relatively unscathed. We'll just watch here. No signalling by the guide to the course workers that they need assistance. So hopefully Sarah's, as you say, relatively unhurt. 20-year-old there. Composing herself at the side of the hill. And well, at the top. No sign of nerves from the remaining competitors. Okay. Also, our 
Swedish leader in giant in the giant slalom standings at this moment. She too would like uh, Veronica Eigner having a, a very a, a strong, strong run of uh, results so far this season, especially in the in the technical events. <laughs> Yeah, just a, a short pause, I would estimate, here, so hopefully we'll be able to continue with the live action here on FIS TV in a few short moments, just while we check on the athletes who are uh, still at the side of the course. Gentle lower section here for uh, Sara Choi with her guide Sung Hyun Jung. The Korean pair sliding down, side slipping down the final pitch while stopping the start area. Great Britain's Mena Fitzpatrick and her guide Katie Guest just absorb this unplanned pause in the proceedings. Well, certainly the most experienced competitor here at, uh, in the women's VI category. 25 years old. <laughs> yeah. It's a trademark smile from Mena. She's uh, showing no nerves there at all. Coming to this competition from, oh, from a victory on this hill a couple of days ago. Seems to have refound her giant slalom form. And uh, both she and Katie very relaxed here. It'll all change in a moment or two. I think we're probably a minute or two at the most away from a restart Perfect. here in this women's giant Short slalom competition. We Selling start uh, in uh, 50 seconds. In ready, go. Really seconds, I think we heard yeah, there ready, from go. our start referee, go. our starter rather. Ready? Okay. Okay. Go. Very good. Okay. They're getting them underway real quickly here. And out of the gate goes number five, Fitzpatrick, on course for Team GBR. And nicely in sync, this pair. Line just a little late there from the red to blue. It's a long, long left foot transition there. Again, really close to the gates there. Cutting that tight line. She's breaking just a little through the turn. Drift rather than carve, but uh, keeping the work rate solid. Good timing, good synchronicity between them. And it's fine, looking for the aerodynamic tuck position there. Definitely trying to hunt down their previous skiers ahead of her. The Eigner's maybe tough to catch in this first run. And our final competitor in the women's visually impaired category, Mena Fitzpatrick, goes over the line. So fourth place for now. For now. check on the standings now for us hopefully we'll have a graphic yeah there's confirmation unfortunately Sara Choi of Korea will not be back for a second run but four of the five competitors in this women visually impaired category safely in the finish area and led by Austria's Veronica Eigner now we'll back up at the top another little look into the final preparation of uh, for these youngsters getting ready to take to the hill. We're on this Canon P2 
artists here in Stella Neve was in the, the Julian Alps or the Friuli district of northern Italy, northeastern Italy, where pretty much just a stone's throw from the border with Slovenia, borders with Slovenia and with Austria, of course, Austria just to the north of where we are. So we're right in the northeastern corner of the Italian mountains. looking across to the east there in the in the distance and you're really looking right into Yugoslav in the former Yugoslavia into Slovenia and uh, nearby ski area of Kranska Gora which uh, was due to host a couple of giant slaloms last week and these are actually these giant slaloms rescheduled by virtue of us having uh, lost the downhill here. So we're into the women's standing category. First out, Eva Arjo, super successful young Swede. She's an LW4 skier, so that means she has a severe impairment on one side of her lower body, or her, the one of her lower limbs. You can, that shows up in the relative strength between left and uh, right turns but Eva more than makes up for that lack of strength in one leg with her power and determination I mean I mean her mental focus and determination really active on the skis here coming through onto the final drop to the finish line and uh, I think we'll see a repeat of the women's VI here where we'll see a very quick, very fast time set by our opening skier. 33, that's quick for sure. Choppy conditions there showing up in our uh, slow picks as we quickly get the action back underway up at the top with uh, France is undisputed Paralympic Alpine champion, the very experienced Marie Boucher. He runs wide there. That gate's caught a few of the skiers out. It's actually on the flats, but because the piece swings across to the right, the skiers have to set up a little bit higher for the left foot turn. And uh, as they have to move from her left side across to the right of the piste. Boucher keeps it solid through these closing turns, working well as it gets to the last of the steep sections. Straight tuck for the line now. Crosses the line. I don't have a time there, but I don't quite think she'll have matched the sweep. A <laughs> big shrug of the shoulders there. I think. Uh, Maybe yourself knows that as well. Next up, one of our Canadian skiers, Michele Gossela. Yeah, Gossela on course here. Refresh my technical data. There we go. Plus 2.08 the gap to the Swedish leader here for the young Canadian. And just uh, to confirm, Marie Boucher's time 59.37. That leaves a deficit of 1.04 for the French woman against our Swedish leader. Safely over the finish line there, Gosselin in the finish area. That's a smile from her. That was a tough run. These uh, ripples that are in the snow, there's not enough snow really for them to have packed the snow in a way that it's leaving a really smooth running surface. So it makes for uh, an unrelenting degree of work as the skier makes their way from top to bottom. And 
Maria Rida here for Germany gets pushed wide to her left on that bogey gate just on the peace transition as she comes through the gully. Back on the attacking line here now. Only 1400s at that top split, so competitive in the early turns. Clock ticking down now. The time to beat is 58.33. Germany pushing on for the line, 59.10. And a gap of 0 0.77 only to our Swedish leader. So Sweden in the command of this situation, followed by Germany, France and Canada. And Team USA are on the course. Ooh, a big inside lean there for Ali Johnson. To try to get a little more of her weight over cleanly over the single outside ski. Letting them run well though, 2.42. It's a uh, gap to fourth at the moment is 4.94, so she could stay in touch with the potential podiums with this run, barring any mistakes in these closing few turns. Almost. In sight of the finish here now. A couple more gates and then it's the final rollover. Looking tired, getting pushed really low. Having to make a big adjustment. That's a shame for Ali. A lot of momentum lost there. She made that recovery. 7.49 the gap. Her total time 105.82. Claire Petit for the... Dutch team. First of our three trackers, LW4 classification athlete. Working well. Light conditions improving. The fog that was kind of stuck on the piste has uh, departed now. And blue sky starting to show. So Better conditions for all the athletes, for sure. 2.15 at the split time for the Netherlands team. Claire Petit keeping the work rate solid here in the closing turns. The physical challenge this hill. These little washboard ripples sap the energy with each and every turn. Heading for the line now. She looks to have made it safely. Tucks in. 4.68, that's good enough for fourth position and uh, gives her a fighting chance, I would say. Claire Petit there to push for a podium come the second run. Now, Austria's first standing skier today, Eva Maria Jocho. Uh, it's a good good execution there in this traverse section and uh, 0 0.240 the gap to Arjo. These clean turns get a good grip here. Oh, another skier beginning to Feel the, feel the physical effort, the legs wobbling a little in these closing turns, but uh, over she goes. Sixth spot for now, 7.15, so in uh, relative terms, she's reasonably well in touch with the leaders. Now, Ami Hondo for Japan. Real athletic skier, very, very strong athlete. Perhaps she can put that part of her capacity to good use down here on these uh, this rolling piece, the cannon. It's been a host piece for the World Champion, World Paralympic Championships, Para-Alpine Championships, I should say, back in 2019. And, uh, a real Tough hill. Oh, Hondo gets squashed onto the tails of her skis. Very close to getting 
compressed in the back seat there. Hangs on, pushes forward. Remember the gap was 3.57 at the split. Tucks in. Great aerodynamic tuck position there. Seventh though, uh, just ahead of America's Ali Johnson and tucked in behind Austria's Jojo. So a little bit far off the top spots, but uh, definitely a competitive group of skiers forming there just outside of the top four or five in this giant slalom first run. Nice slow-mo picks there, unfortunately showing the snow starting to break up. So the provisional standings, Sweden from Germany, from France, Eba Arjo ahead of Anne-Marie Brem, and then France in third spot for now with Marie Boucher. Now that concludes the women's standing section and we move on to the sitting athletes. And Elena Forster, there she is. Uh, she should be first up wearing the leader bib. Now that means she has, by virtue of her performances so far this season, accumulated the greatest number of World Cup points, 100 World Cup points awarded to the winner of each and every World Cup competition in each discipline, 80 to second, 60, 50, and so on down the rankings. Forster, a, a really experienced skier. And, uh, yeah, regular performer on the World Cup tour for the German team. There's a couple of adjustments to be made. Notably, the, the start gate needs adjusted for the sit skiers so that uh, they get the higher wand. It's about there's a German ski technician, just hash, just giving some last words of wisdom and advice to Forster as she gets ready to launch on course. First of our seated athletes now, the setup of the, the rig, the the Sitski itself and the suspension system will be critical today because of these washboard ripples. And you can see the ski bouncing a little as she goes in through the transition from turn to turn. Just in that little split second where the ski is light, that's where the, the suspension system needs to stabilize the, the movement of the ski under the seat of the Sitski. Oh, a little adjustment there, runs in very hot to these tricky traverse gates. There's your early split time for the sitting category. Forster powering on down the final pitch. Keeps it calm, keeps it steady, runs wide on a couple of these lower turns, but maintains the momentum. That's smart skiing by Forrester. She knows she can't just take a bullet straight line here because of the bumps, but keeps the ski sweeping from left to right and runs straight to the finish now. And over the line she goes. 101.43. A little shake of the head. She's not best pleased with that performance by the looks of things, but... Uh, I would say she's maybe been a little harsh on herself there. I think uh, tactics, especially for the sit skiers, tactics and the, the actual approach in, in terms of how aggressive the skiers try to ski the line today, I think will be, a, a, if not the deciding factor, major factor, if not the deciding factor in, uh, in, the, in the final classifications. Laurie Stevens on course here for Team USA, taking a, a a slightly conservative approach, giving the course a lot of respect. The coaches will be saying that again. Laurie experienced enough to know that getting to the finish line is not just about maximum speed from one gate to the next. It's about carrying the momentum, managing to ski within your own abilities, but also the capacity of the equipment to keep you stable and safe on the hill. And the setup of her rig looks really aggressive to me. You know, the ski skipping and hopping off these ripples. But uh, Laurie Stevens stays on top of the action, gets the shoulders forward as she crosses the line. Second position for now in the first run standings, provisional standings, of course. And uh, we're on course with the Dutch team here, Bar Barbara van Bergen. 
again, one of the regular contenders for the Netherlands in the para-alpine discipline. She too got caught out in that big sweeping right-hand turn into the gully. It will play a part, that particular bit of the hill, in, in certainly in the Super G competition, which we've got coming up in a few days, and uh, in its partner event, the Alpine Combined. Bergen must have been in a bit of a check there to hang on to the line. Run straight now, shoulders down over the line, close run thing there, 0.78 at the final check. So the standings right now are Germany from the Netherlands, from the USA, and we have Spain on course. Eddie Pascual Seco, athlete who I'm not so familiar with, but Certainly what I'm seeing here, looking to make this a competitive run. Third fastest split time there for Pascual. Running very quick here. Needs to maybe just get a little more shape in the turn, a bit more swing across the hill. Good job there on the double gate. Now coming across onto this final pitch. And makes a really good job of these turns on the transition onto the last steep bit. Oh, right on the limit. Almost got flipped off the ski there. Pushing things right to the limit. Certainly no lack of commitment here from this young lady. Audrey goes across the line. Third place for now. 2.77 the gap. <laughs> yeah. Another skier shaking her head a little, but... Uh, Certainly can't fault the effort here. Took things as close to the edge as she could. It was just on this next transition. If we hang on to the slow-mo pick, just got kicked off the snow there. She goes out of out of shot, but good job there. And uh, Pascal Seco holds on to that third place. So only four competitors in the women's sitting division here this morning. And Elena Forster, despite frustration with her uh, run, hangs on to the lead by her. A pretty healthy margin, but a very competitive van, uh, Barbara van Bergen is behind her with a 0.78 gap to try to find and try to work on come the second leg. Then Spain, who just saw a 2.77 back, and Laurie Stevens, a little further back for Team USA, sits in fourth, 9.06 off of our German leader. Okay, over to the men's division and uh, French team getting warmed up there. The uh, first competitor will be Michal Golas, one of our Polish skiers. A couple of uh, the local schools here have been given the day off to come and watch these incredible athletes and uh, the youngsters getting a good vantage position down at the bottom. see anything there so in case we disturbed Arthur Boucher there as he was doing his mental rehearsal but uh, we're on course here with the first of the men's VI pairings for this giant slalom competition Poland this is and uh, we've got Mikhail Golas and his guide uh, Kaspar Valas strong contenders in every outing so far this season uh, Polish pairing looking pretty solid here once again and followed by one of the more if not the most experienced competitor in the men's visually impaired uh, category uh, that's Miroslav of Haraus but uh, let's focus on the Polish pair here as they head down through the lower part of the competition hill. Right short giving you a good indication there of uh, how fast they're traveling across the hill, across the snow rather. So there's your early time. 
57.38 for this men's visually impaired uh, category. Now, Maros Hudik guiding Harouse here. Slovakian pairing uh, in together now for oh, best part. Oh, Harouse makes a big mistake now, and the guide's got a little bit ahead. He has to hang on and let uh, Miroslav catch up with him just a little bit so they can build that partner work that they do so well. But that was a very costly error and the, the adjustment took a long time for them to get back in connection with each other. And again, Maros having to stand up and bleed speed off as he lets uh, Harris catch up with him. So a little bit inconsistent from the boys here. They're keeping it going, no? Certainly no lack of physical commitment from this pair. Arrows grunting his way around these closing turns into the final straight away and over the line. And yeah, as we thought, that mistake costing him quite dearly. 5.31 back. Uh, just a quick update as we uh, catch up with Mingu Huang from Korea. Uh, our favourite for a reason unbeknownst to me. I'll find out as quickly as I can what's happened to Giacomo Bertagnoli. But he was not at the start. So uh, the local favourite and the man who many had predicted to be uh, the likely victor in this uh, category, not at the start. Anyhow, uh, on course... Wang, 0.36 the gap at the top split. Really competitive run here. Koreans now going for the line. Lots of instruction coming from the guide. They're safely over. Ooh, a crash in the finish area though. Let's hope he's okay. The snow's pretty soft down there, so should slow down quickly. And uh, we're right away back to the top of the hill. The live action continue fast and furious. Alexander Rowan, the German team. Moving well is uh, his guide, uh, Jeremias Wilke, doing a good job here. Pair of them keeping a really tight connection. B3 category, so the the least severe of the visual impaired categories. There's B1, B2, B3, and uh, the B1 is the most severe level of impairment, B3 the least, but uh, believe you me, folks, these guys and girls, what they're doing out there that baffles me, <laughs> despite having worked on the tour, it really baffles me how they're able to ski so ably on it's not just any old race hill. This is a, a very, very tough hill. Immense amount of terrain there. Anyway, Germany over the line, sitting in third place. And uh, now we're looking at our, uh, our probably our strongest favourite, I think it's fair to say. And yeah, the name should be familiar. This is more of the Eigner clan. This is uh, Johannes, one of the Eigner siblings. And... Uh, the Austrian team wearing the, the red tour leader bib. Johannes, uh, with his guide, Nico Haberl, have uh, pretty much had had it their own way all season long and uh, leading the World Cup standings as we take, uh, take in the final stop here in Italy on this 2024 FIS Para Alpine season. Real good work from this pair, keeping the connection nice and tight, but most importantly, keeping those skis carving left and right. Now tucking in unison over the line. That was strong, strong run, and no surprise there. Clear into the lead, the gap. Quite a big one, 1.51 seconds. Now Sierra Smith guiding Kaya Eriksson. This pair of... Uh, come on strongly this season. We'll uh, 
real strong performances from them throughout the winter. Aggressive skiing there by Ericsson. Uh, I think if he, I think he might agree that he's very strong in slalom as well. I wouldn't say he's an absolute slalom specialist, but certainly these genius skills are really impressive here today. Very much in touch with Eigner's, with Eigner's time. Coming now for the line. Crossing very closely together. And look at that. Only 0.38. This is going to be a real shootout come the second run. So uh, no big predictions for me for the moment, that's for sure. Eigner leads. Ericsson just going into third. And uh, the live action continues with our, our final skier in this category. Yasson de la Place, the French team. This guy, Roy Picard. Just stretching the gap. Almost to the limit, I would say. Isanthi's a, a B2 skier, so he needs the gap to be as tight as uh, as tight as they dare, really. So that's the guide's job to get the pair moving as quickly as possible, but uh, it's a, an important part of the role to keep that gap tight. This is a better better spacing here, I would say, and they can build things up from here. They've got 1.26 to find maybe too much of an ask to look to take the lead, but looking to go into a potential podium. 1.78, it's not far off it. Fourth position for De La Place. <laughs> All smiles as he starts to get the breath back. And these slow-mo pictures give you a real strong idea of yeah, the, the physical demands of this hill, these washboards, as I'm calling them, really challenging the balance and the strength of the athletes. But there's the confirmed standings for now. Eigner from Ericsson from Hoang. It's your top three. Got their 1.51 for the podium and uh, the French just behind 1.78 off the leader's pace here at the end of the first run of the men's VI category. Now, just checking on start list here. Seems like there's been a bit of confusion over some of the bibs this morning, the start bibs, the numbers the athletes wear, but uh, certainly there's a picture that clears up any confusion about who's, uh, who's in command of the situation so far at this late stage in the 2024 winter. Arthur Bouchier, the young Frenchman, on screen wearing the leader bib by virtue of strong performances in every one of his outings so far this season. Uh, Boucher gets us underway for the standing category. He's an LW3 classification athlete. His condition presents much like cerebral palsy would with uh, impairment down the whole of one side of his body so Boucher battles fatigue you know is a fatigue onset is far greater than uh, uh, an athlete without that sort of condition but uh, seeing Boucher ski when he gets the bit between the teeth you wouldn't uh, really know it Driving long and strongly round on the left ski there. Real good technique. You can tell when he's in balance. If you see the ripples that bounce his head and shoulders around. That's when the, the bumps proving the athletes are right on the limit. Punching over the line there, Artur Boucher 
54.82. That was a strong run. We'll watch that time closely. Yeah, Federico Pelletari for the Italian team. A good line on the top part. Get right in close on the gates, but keeping the transition from turn to turn real short. You know, a quick switch from left to right ski and right to left. Allows him to maintain the carve, keep control, and from that control, try to find acceleration down the fall line. 1.86 to find on the lower part of the hill. His uh, classification, the measure of his impairment, doesn't allow him any handicap time, any time off. That's why it says factor 100%. So when the clock is running, for Pelzari, he's, he's running in real time. Uh, Aaron Lindstrom is in the same category, same classification as Pelzari, so he'll have 100% factoring as well. So no, uh, no percentage of the time deducted to balance the the clock against the athletes, different differing levels of impairment within their main categories, be they visually impaired, standing athletes or sitting skiers. Ooh, Lindstrom very strong on the outside ski on that turn. I think the, the coaches are all understanding now they need to let their athletes know that that long left footer coming through the gully or into the gully is uh, one of the the key parts of the course. Ooh, Lindstrom gets all twisted around. Makes the recovery, though. He's on a really hot line there, trying to make up for that mistake, I would say. 2.33, the gap at the top split. Pushes over the line, 3.65. That gap's grown. Lindstrom into third for now. 22 competitors in the men's standing division, so... A lot of talent up there still to take to the hill. This is uh, Norway's sole skier in, uh, in, the, in the stand up category. Marcus Krasto Nielsen. He's uh, LW572, so a, a fairly Hefty factoring he's got. What's that? 5.68, 5 5 5.78, sorry, uh, percent off of his time deducted. That's done on the fly, if you like, or in real time. So the clock you're seeing on your screens there has already been adjusted uh, to allow for the athlete's factoring. Marcus getting the body down low now to try to get out of the wind, create that aerodynamic position as he goes for the line. 7.02 the gap, that's good enough for fourth place. And, uh, we're over now. Santeri Kieri, our uh, sole Finnish competitor in the men's standing category. Good speed across this little traverse section. Gets himself close to the leaders, 2.72. See where that would put him if I look at my live standing. Certainly good enough to be on the provisional podium. Ooh, a little choppy on these turns, though. He needs to get forward a little on this steep section. It's going to flatten off in a second or two, but. Not able to make speed off that last part, and the, yeah, the gap grows as a result, 5.99. And uh, that sees him drop from what could have been a potential podium or provisional podium. Uh, Santeri drops to fourth position at the moment. Rance again on course. This is Oscar Burnham. 
nice fluid loose movements but keeping the ski running cleanly this is strong skiing from oscar round he goes a difficult turn here's the split third fastest on the top section at this point in the competition with only four or five six rather into uh men's standing division A total of 22 starters in this category here he goes for the line finds a real straight section through these closing four or five gates and yeah up to fourth position there good strong skiing on the lower part for the frenchman sees him go fourth in uh, the provisional standings tommy grocher from austria actually from just across the border actually a native of Kärnten or the Corinthia region in the southern corner of Austria. Tommy, powerful as ever, dynamic, very athletic skier. Absolutely excels in slalom, but uh, here in GS he's uh, no slouch either. Late there, coming off that uh, long red gate turn, the long right hander he's got the rhythm on the line back under control here though and got the smooth sweeping giant slalom turns working well for him on these lower curves final little steep section here sets up well for it gets dropped a little on the red gate though but hangs on to the line now should be good from here he's to try to run it straight yeah Grocher kept a lid on that run. He's sometimes been a little inconsistent, but sees himself safely down in fifth place. And uh, right back to the top here with Jordan Brassin. The French really packing them in in this division. Remember, Arthur Boucher, the number one skier, leads this first run of the GS, men's GS, at the moment. Up. Well, for now, that's good enough for third third place. Now, he's an LW4 skier. He's skiing with a prosthetic limb. You can see his uh, left, left, left lower leg. He's uh, wearing a prosthesis there. Good work in those lower turns. Stays in that fourth provisional position. Uh, but he's very, very close. Less than a tenth from uh, third place. So that's going to be a, a competitive area when we come to the second round. Remember, the guys are going to go in reverse order of their finish times. So as things stand at the moment, Boche will be last to start if uh, things stay as they are in the standings next man to try to make a dent on those standings so make his impression Patrick Halgren of the US ski team Team USA so yeah yeah right he's a native Australian but the US ski team coach Ryan Perrell he's the course setter for this morning's first run a lot of people always ask me, does it does it create an advantage if your coach has uh, set the course? Maybe a minor psychological comfort, to be honest. But ultimately, the bottom line is everybody's got to ski the same set of turns. So uh, from the moment you push out of the start gate, it's all on your shoulders. Nobody else is really. So uh, Halgren can expect no favours from the hill. He does a good job there on those closing turns. In their ninth quickest so far. He's a little ways further back than I think he would have hoped. He's not far off uh, Norway's Marcus Nilsson Grasdo, who's 13 hundredths ahead of him. And uh, the Austrian challenge continues. Uh, Marcus Salcher, a very familiar face on the World Cup and uh, Paralympic Tour. Another uh, 
native of Cairnton, so a man who's not had far to travel to get to the competition venue here. Selling the Via Tervisio, which is, I say, just across the border, just south of Austria and just to the west of Slovenia. So uh, for the guys from Cairnton, it's not, not much of a hop at all. Salcher, he's the... Four oh seven, yeah, four oh seven. Time the gap, seventh position for him. Packing in very tightly. The guys are between say third and eighth, so uh, a, a bit of a gap opening out now between the guys in the top steps of the, the standings at the moment. So you take a look at uh, Jesse Keith uh, for the US ski team. the work rate high but keep the keep the rhythm of the course keep the skis swinging try to find a smooth transition from turn to turn but at the same time put maximal pressure down on the turning ski and try to get it carving as cleanly as possible JC another skier with a prosthetic limb in the LW4 category, staying loose but strong on the ski, running well, running quickly now for the line, punching over, 6.42 the gap for him. Jules Seegers for the French team next on course. W9-2 classification athlete, so a fairly hefty factor to assist him. Nice turns over the split time marker, 1.99. Competitive skiing here from Sagers. For the athletes, the, the LW9 athletes, uh, many of whom have cerebral palsy or a, a similar condition, um, these sort of courses with the cons constant bumpiness um, really sap the energy for, for these athletes. So Seeger's doing well to hang on there, getting caught up in that second to last gate and almost spun round off the course, but uh, managed to hang on. Another athlete in a similar category on course, not France this time, but their neighbours Switzerland. Ooh, Robin Kusch almost gets himself high-sided off the left ski early on, up on the top section of the course. Just not managing to engage accurately with the ruts here, I would say. He's just going in a little direct and not able to use the ruts that are beginning to form now to his best advantage. low as the fatigue begins to show particularly on his right side he's in touch with the leaders though Ooh, hanging on here just just no more making those turns right on the tails of his skis pushing pushing for the max here Robin Kush. Gets the reward from all those risks that he took. Uh, second position for now. <laughs> yeah. Time to try to recover and get some energy back into the system for the second run. Robin Kush there showing in the slow-mo that he had things right on the limit. Strong stuff from the Swiss skier. Uh, Canada will be up next. The number 39, that's Alexi Guimond. A little break here while we just do a bit of coursework, I'm imagining. Quick look at the standings uh, as uh, Alexis Guimond makes his final preparation uh, for Tour Boucher. 
Bangs on to the lead, Robin Kush of Switzerland, who we saw just a moment ago in second. And then 3.23 seconds back in third position is Italy's Federico Pellizzari. We're back on deck with a live action. Alexis Guimond on course for Canada. Little patches of mist rolling through, but it won't really affect these guys. In general, the weather seems to be improving. Guimond struggling here a bit. Didn't ever seem to be able to get in the groove right from the first couple of gates. Unable to find the power to get on top of the ski. So not looking at all comfortable here. Let's hope he's okay. And then we'll get assistance from some of the coaching staff in a moment or two. I really put my finger on exactly what went wrong, but he didn't ever seem to be able to settle into the get in the groove of the the turns and the rhythm of the course. Well, more news on uh, Alexi when we can bring it to you probably during the second or the gap between the second run and uh, and this current run we'll be able to catch up on some news from the coaches but um, the live action keeps rocking on this is another of the our Austrian neighbours here Nico Pjanic Pjanic uh, regular performer for the Austrian team growing in strength and experience with every season no favours from the factoring system for Nico so he really has to take every risk and uh, make each and every turn as clean as he possibly can nice smooth skiing from Nico here in now for the line tucking in really good tuck position there Pjancic over the line, 3.61 the gap. That's him just off the provisional podiums in fourth position. So as we saw, nice clean skiing, smooth execution is uh, one of the one of the keys today here on the Canon Piste in Sela Nevea. At least Davide Bendotti on course. for the LW4s, for the, the lower limb amputees who uh, ought not to ski with prosthesis. Oh, keeping the turn smooth is a uh, key, but keeping things upright equally important. So uh, Bendotti goes out, unable to hang on on those difficult washboard bumps. Really tough for the LW4s today, these... Uh, with only one ski, one set of edges, you really have no margin for error. There's no room for recovery. And as, as he got a, his weight a little bit inside there, the bumps made the ski run out of the turn. Then Dotty goes down on his right side, his left side rather, as a result of the ski breaking away. And unfortunately for him, his race is run. So um, not a great day so far for the Italians, to be fair. Uh, Bertagnoli not at the start and the men's visually impaired and uh, now Davide Bendotti who we saw just uh, going off the course it's not the uh, best start for the host nation here now however the competition continues bid 42 another of the Austrians in that classic looking Austrian red and white race suit Manuel Rachbauer getting himself ready. Uh, he's another 9 1 category skier or classified skier. So, impairment affecting his right side of his body. 
so it doesn't doesn't use a right ski pole. So the majority of the work, the majority of the steering and balancing has to be done with the stronger side with the left side. And uh, this course, I wouldn't say it favours the, the guys who are maybe skiing strongly with a, a left ski, um, but it does swing to the right. So that puts more emphasis on the left foot turns or the turns where you're deflecting your momentum towards the right. But just... Uh, just right on cue, unfortunately. Bach Bowers down and out at the same spot as uh, as Ben Dotti went down a moment ago. So that uh, sweeping left foot turn going into the going into the gully uh, is a real a real key section on this uh, Canon piece here this morning in the in these World Cup finals. German coach doing the neighbourly thing. Justus Wolf, head coach of the German programme there, helping Rachbauer out, saying, take your time, compose yourself, and uh, get yourself safely off the hill. The race is on hold, so he gives us a chance to have a look at what went wrong. Bit of a 50-50 shot there, that I think not really standing strongly on the outside ski, but it looked like perhaps the binding let go a little bit easily there, but uh, ultimately... Same result, Rachbauer is uh, out and joins the spectators at the side of the hill with a DNF, does not finish uh, his mark on the results list. Germany up next where we have this, uh, this little hold for the course to be declared safe. Christoph, Christoph Glutzner, he's ready to go and it looks like the Start crew are ready. That, that wand, there it is on the right of your screen, crossing over and uh, connects into that wiring mechanism there or the switching mechanism into the wires there. And that's what starts the clock running as the athlete pushes out of the gate. There he goes. Glutner, Glutzner, rather, uh, on course for the German team. But LW4 now. This section right here, although, yeah, the snow is softening a little, but these ripples and the, the tighter set of gates in the section he's just negotiated uh, are make it tricky. And the, the turn that he's just finished there just now, the blue gate just going out of vision, that seems to be becoming a bit of a bogey gate. It's real bumpy, and if you run low in the line, those bumps are more severe. So that's where Bendotti and uh, some of the others have, have, have run into bother. But Glutzner, when we saw the German coach, Eustace Wolf, he's right on that spot. So he'll have relayed clear instructions via the team radio up to the start. So Glutzner obviously taking those tips on board safely down I would say from here over the line he goes 11th spot 4.91 so inside that five second margin yeah, looks a little frustrated with his efforts but certainly for my money that was a strong run keeping them going this is Andrew Harake another of the American skiers Now, 84.36, he's an LW1, his, his impairment affects his condition rather, impairs his ability pretty much evenly on both sides of his body. So uh, he has a, a heftier factor, a more favourable factor, 84.36 uh, on the, your screens there to level up the, the, the way that the clock assesses how the guys are performing. So for the LW1s, really keeping the, the turning action smooth is, is, is crucial because of that loss of movement, loss of swing from side to side. Oh, it's a shame. Fatigue creeping in there, I think. And down he goes. Has to come, if you come to a stop in any of the disciplines now, uh, ultimately you have to out of the race so that's Harahe, Andrew Harahe, that was a, a disappointing exit from the race for him because uh, up until that point things were looking pretty solid we're 
on course again with the Germans. Keeping things going fast and furious. This is Leander Kress. Round he goes. Strong turns there. And he's swinging across the right. And then on the little toe turn, if you like, he's got to compensate for the the mechanical disadvantage he finds himself at of, if you like, standing on the wrong edge of the wrong ski to get himself around the turn. So keeping the body still, keeping the upper body in balance, keeping the weight driving forward, more crucial than ever for these athletes. Right on the limit here. Oh, he's just missed that red gate. Couldn't get that small toe turn, the, the difficult foot turn. Couldn't quite get the direction. So... Um, our German skier Leander Kress is also going to be a DNF, does not finish. Uh, graphics are looking quicker than our skiers. Are. This is now number 46. This is Spencer Wood for the American ski team. With he and our following skier from the Czech Republic, Thomas Barberka. They're LW92 athletes, so same category as... Uh, similar kind of we don't have any nine twos down yet actually but we've got a clutch of nine ones so you've got the likes of uh robin kush and co in the in the lw9 family if you like 91.83 the the factoring the percentage uh on his time uh courtesy of his classification Ooh, he's really letting them go here actually a, yeah Team USA coming for the line nice job there Spencer Wood you saw a tenth spot there now this is our uh, final competitor for this morning's first run for the men standing that is we've uh, into the the hotshot sit skiers next, 17 of those guys to come. But uh, Thomas Faverka will be the last of our athletes. He's actually the lowest seeded athlete in uh, these World Cup finals, in the men's standing division anyway. And uh, taking uh, a lot of a lot of important experience, big event experience home from these competitions. Although the World Cup finals are neither World Championships nor Paralympic Winter Games, the finals being the culmination of the season carry a lot of weight with them. Many of the national associations will use them as, as benchmarks, if you like, for future squad selection. And uh, of course, it's the last opportunity for athletes to score World Cup points to... Uh, try to improve on their World Cup standings for the whole season. So, final competitor, Thomas Baverka, for the men's standing category, safely over the line, 16th spot for him. There's the slow-mo picture showing, uh, showing that course really isn't improving and those ruts and bumps are becoming a little more difficult with each and every one of the runners. And there's the official graphics for those standings. Boucher from Cooch, from Pellizzari. Federico Pellizzari skiing strongly this season for the Italian team. The uh, Austrian veterans, Grocher and Salzer, Salcher, rather, a little bit further back than they would have liked in ninth and 10th. A few did not finish as five in total. And uh, the big disappointment for the local fans, obviously, Davide Bendotti going down on that tricky long left footer uh, coming into the gully. Uh, many victims claimed by that series, uh, that section of the course so far this morning. Well, quick look at the hill as we uh, make the adjustments. New start ones set up, and uh, you can see there from everybody's attire, it's, uh, this is springtime in the Julian Alps, that's for sure. Kurt Otway, probably the most experienced competitor on their squad, looking very focused, very determined. Argentina represented there, and uh, all smiles. It's funny the different, um, everybody's different approach, their different looks. Uh, 
at the top. Now it's Enrique Plante, Kurt Oatway, who we just saw, and Jesper Peterson will get us underway right now. The Red Bib Tour Leader for this 2024 FIS World Cup Para Alpine Circuit. Uh, Peterson, clean sweep in GSs. Multiple gold medalist in the last couple of games. And, uh, most notably, I would say, was an absolute sweep in the uh, in uh, in the Paralympic Games in uh, in Be in Beijing, four golds rather, but uh, really impressive stuff. A great rivalry between he and uh, Holland's or Netherlands here in Hampshire. I'm sure will be with us shortly, but Peterson showing his trademark risk-taking style here. Really letting it fly on the lower run, showing he means business. Looking to wrap up his GS season with another victory, 53-81. That's fast. Oatway is on course for Canada. But uh, Peterson showing the way with that run. That's going to be tough to beat. I would suggest Oatway diving in deep into these turns. Rig doing a great job. The suspension looks to be set up very, very well. All the movement happening just as it should. The suspension system absorbing the shock of the, the bumps and then extending the the rig again to help keep the ski in contact with the snow. He is losing a little bit of ski to snow contact, but we're riding it out. 0.94 off of Peterson's time at the top split, and he's, uh, I would say, slightly cleaner than the Norwegian skier was on this section giving it a bit more respect. Peterson really took big risks there. Oatway has a slightly more measured approach. What's the final result? Well, it's, I would say, cost him a little bit of time, but he's safely in the finish and uh, provisionally at 2.13 back. That puts him in second position for now. Ponte for the Argentinian team. Team. He says more or less a one-man team. Ooh, really wide on that blue. Look at the, the deep the track he dug there. Trying to get back on the ideal racing line. Plante takes the long way around there. See uh, how much uh, the clock will punish him for that. The split 1.21, not too bad actually. That was uh, he did a good job of getting out of trouble there. Skied himself back onto the line smoothly rather than uh, trying to make too, main, too much of an adjustment and uh, risking scrubbing more speed off as a result. So, you know, a very experienced competitor now. Enrique, oh, he's in very hot to this blue gate. He's going to make the red just. That, uh, oh, that was touch and go in those closing gates. He's lucky to make it to the line there. Third position for now, 2.32. He's very close to Oatway. And, uh, yeah, the competition is going to be pretty hot come the second run. I would say already, you know, no less than, less than three-tenths between second and third at the moment. This is Ravi Dugan for the American team. He's a 12-2 athlete, so it's sixth the neighbouring uh, classification to Kurt Oatway. There's three main levels of uh, classification for the sitting skiers, LW10, 11 and 12, and the, 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 the 12s and 10s have a, a, a couple of sub-sections, so those uh, varying levels of classification determine the, the factoring that is applied to the racers, individual racers' time. So the clock ticks on for Drugan. Fourth position, 5.62 back on the leaders. 
But I think, you know, certainly scheme-wise, not much to complain about, I would say, with that run. He can build on that come the second half of today's competition. Now, super experienced, probably the most experienced competitor on the hill today. Takeshi uh, Suzuki. And teammate Taiki Mori, real veterans of the, uh, of the Paralympic Tour. She's going in very, very straight to some of these turns, but uh, the Japanese seem to always seem to have practically the ideal setup on their rigs. They spend an awful lot of time, and I mean ev every day, working on the finer elements of the tuning of the rig. Keeping it going. So these skiers with the more heavier classification it's uh, really important to keep the ski tracking smoothly Suzuki fourth it is for now and uh, the action keeps going Niels de Langen another of the very competitive Dutch skiers he's our next competitor work through here staying out of the worst of the ruts is uh, De Langen. Leaves him a little bit offline is to make a big adjustment as he come back onto the steeper section of the course. That's why you see the ski almost popping off the snow or actually coming off the snow sometimes in the transition. Just to chop off the top of the turn as best he can and then try to set the carve up. That's beautiful skiing there. That's uh, through that section, now I would say that's up about the mark of Jesper Pedersen through those turns, but uh, it's close and close enough for second. 1.02. Pedersen may not have this all his own way come the second run. The Netherlands skiers are trying to hunt them down. Uh, second of our Japanese competitors, which is seen to Keishi Suzuki and this is Taiki Mori. Super smooth turns up here. This is excellent skiing. Just sometimes a little bit, hang on a little bit long to the end of the turn, but he's in touch with our leaders, no question. Ooh, there's a wee mistake there. Bounced wide on the blue gate. Just lost contact with the snow and had to make an adjustment. That'll have cost him, well, I would, I would say anything up to four tenths or so. He's working well through the middle part here. Doing a slightly wider line than some, but carrying very high speed across the snow, I would say. So despite that mistake, he's definitely not done yet. Tucks in for the line, third position. And the, the mistake costing us, we would have expected, but um, definitely in touch at 1.95 back. Ooh, into the fence. That was a big, big hit. That was uh, Louis Braz de Agand, Frenchman, going into the B netting very heavily. Looks to be all right, though. He managed to get the ski around in front of him, and that seemed to take most of the, the hit as he went into the fence. Let's have a close look at what went amiss here. The rig gets very deeply compressed. He hits that next bump and the ski just keeps turning, keeps hooking him up the hill. He couldn't un unload or unlock from the the edge that was already engaged in the curve, the, the left-hand edge of the ski, digging in, digging in more, and then the hill coming up underneath him. And uh, almost impossible there for him to release the ski to switch across onto the, on, on, onto the other edge and make the next gate. So into the nets he goes, so we'll have a small break here while uh, the course workers put those B nets back in. They do need to be installed properly. They're not just a fence to mark out the side of the hill. They're, they're designed to take a, a, a specific amount of energy out of any crash. So as the athletes pile into those nets, the nets soak up the energy, soak up the momentum, and 
uh, gradually, not gently, but gradually bring the athletes to a halt. So we're uh, just on a short hold and uh, getting a close look at uh, Rennie de Silvestro and his start coach just going through their last moments of preparation. De Silvestro, a strong contender here today. A sense of calm, but very, very gathered, very focused energy about this pair. They're on home snow, remember? So um, if anybody knows how to deal with the cannon piste, Rene de Silvestro may be the man. This is one of those hills that it, it definitely helps to know the terrain, know just where each and every every little roll is. So there's no surprises on the way down. Coach wipes down the ski just one last time. No risk of ice being on the edges or anything like that in the Temperature a good bit above zero here, but getting any excess water off of the top surface of the ski is important so that there's no distractions if that water splashes up into the skier's face unexpectedly. It's a, it could be, a, as I say, simple, simply put, a, a distraction for the focus. A good close-up picture of the suspension system on his rig. majority of the rigs rely on a single shock absorber and a set of linkage, generally linear links. There's very few rising rate suspension systems available so far in the Sitski world. And Silvestro, very clean in these top turns. See, this is home turf for him, so really, yeah, I think using every bit of that knowledge to his advantage here. This is really quick, folks. 83.64, his fat is uh, LW12.1. Ooh, big, big adjustment there, but yep. Smart scheme by De Silvestro. Big, deep, deep angles into these curves to get the ski carving and biting its way around the turn. Momentum looks good. He's 1.08 back on the split time at the halfway spot. He's into the final few seconds of the course here and just a little little more drift than he would have wanted in that previous blue gate. Running straight from here to the finish, though. Over he goes. It's close. Fourth position for him. 2.11. So that's a pretty tightly packed top four. The gap from... Jesper Pedersen goes 1.02 to De Langen, 1.95 to Mori, and then Silvestro, who we've just seen, he's 2.11, so everything to play for. Kurt Otway is in fifth at the moment. He's only two hundredths behind the Italian skier, De Silvestro, who we've just watched. And uh, right now, we're uh, looking at our lone Chilean skier. This is Nicola... Biscerti Hudson, keeping it smooth. Different tactic to the one we've just seen employed by De Silvestro, looking for smooth execution and therefore a, you know, a, a consistent approach rather than a, a, a more direct, a shorter but more risky attacking line like we saw De, De Silvestro taking. So the gap similar to De Silvestro at the split or be scared. Okay, Nicola, he's out of the, the more difficult turns. He's close here to the line. Yes, pretty close. 4.07, good enough for seventh for now. Not sure if that's a smile or a grimace. I'm sure none of this feels very pleasant for the athletes. Uh, it's so rough out there now. But, uh, let's uh, focus our attention very tightly on Jaron Crampshire. He and De Lange in the, the two strongest of the, the Netherlands team. Smart ski in there. Crampshire running the turn out, taking his time in that long double gate turn. And as 
the first person so far in this men's sitting division to have stolen a very slim margin on Jesper Pedersen. So, as predicted, this is going to be close. Five hundreds to the good for Crampshire at the top, and he's on the risky line here. It's quick. He's managed to hang on to clean turns through those last few curves. Goes for the line. Oh, it's second for now. Crampshire just misses out, but he's pleased with that, so he should be. Difficult conditions out there, but uh, Crampshire, like Peterson, really mastered them. Only 22 hundreds between the two top positions here. Uh, this is Pascal Christen for the Swiss. Just giving the hill a little more respect than, uh, than uh, we saw from some of the the, the, the skiers just in front of him, the guys, Crampshire in particular, taking big, big risks. Christina opting for a slightly more conservative approach, but now starting to let the ski run a bit more. Letting it go. It's bounced because of the increased speed. Can maybe use the compression setting, softened a notch or two. Sometimes bouncing him into the air, the, the suspension not giving him enough absorption, I would suggest. I'll leave that to the Swiss technicians tonight, though, to deal with. Christen over in 11th spot, 6.43 back. There's the view from the start. So it's it gets steep pretty quick. The first few gates are not too bad, but from right about here where we're seeing Matthew Ryan Brewer of the US team, this hill is steep, pretty much all the way to the finish. There's a slightly flatter section, just the last four or five gates before they cross the line. But up here, it really is uh, quite unrelenting. The gradient is steep. It's a, a serious red run. And now the piece narrows as he comes through this little gully between the rocks. As he sweeps across to his right side, Brewer keeps the... Action nice and smooth from ski to ski, from edge to edge. Five seconds back at the top. Ooh, little skip from the rig there as the ski loses contact with the surface of the snow. Rides it well though. Now brings this one home safe. Matthew Brewer nicely done across the line there for Team USA. It drops in 10.53 back. That puts him in 12th position for the moment. Now I think this is the last of our Swiss skiers. Yeah. Only three to go in this uh, men's sitting division. This is Christoph Damas for the Swiss team. Great angles. Look at the track he leaves behind. That's good. I love those pictures where you really see perfectly clean carve marks, pencil marks in the snow, the coaches call them. Little skid there, though, drops him off the line. Costs him a little bit of time, I would suggest. Let's see what the clock gives him. 4.32 on the split there. A lot of movement in the rig in this bumpy section coming out of the gully and into the, the finish straight. Onto the flat part now. Christophe should be safe. Damas nicely across the line. 12th spot for now. Difficult conditions out there, particularly for the sit skiers. Over well having mechanical assistance, but there's only so much that the rig can do to deal with these bumps. The skier's skill is an absolute deciding factor in this division. There's no doubt in my mind at all about that. Yeah, 
just a little bit slow getting onto the the, the left foot turn, if you like, and uh, very solid across the this little traverse transition through the gully. Big line adjustment there on the blue, but he gets it back for the red, getting into trouble here with the bumps a little. Trying to get in on the ideal line, but the bumps forcing him out. Now, one last steep pitch here. Three or four gates down this section here. Yeah, he's got the measure of it now. Just gives it a little bit more respect than higher up. Gets himself safely through those tricky last few turns. Over the line he goes. Ronnie Ackerman, Ruben Ackerman rather, for the German team. Over the line and that uh, brings us back to the top and Billy Dravitsky. Who's our only New Zealand skier. And uh, just a nod to my old friend Corey Peters, formerly New Zealand's number one representative in the men's sitski and many, many titles to his credit. And uh, passing the mantle to this young man. 22 years old only, you know, so Billy got a, hopefully a long and a career that hopefully will bring him some of the success that, uh, that Corey Peters earned himself uh, representing New Zealand over the years. So Dravitsky gaining good, uh, really good experience here, if nothing else, on the European snow and having been on the tour this year. No, ooh, let's hang on, hang on to this one, Billy. Get the turn back. Ooh, that was an emergency recovery. That was really powerful stuff to be able to pull off those recovery turns there right at the end of the competition run, just when fatigue would be more than creeping in. Yeah, 15th spot, but for me, the actual position isn't so... <laughs> Important, getting experience, rubbing shoulders with the guys who are the real established uh, athletes. Here's a look back at just how lucky or how skillful this recovery was. Managed to get off the flat ski, slams it onto the left edge and that in turn runs him almost into the fence on the other side of the piece. But he managed to swing it back and made it across the line just in the nick of time. Anyway, Pedersen hangs on to the lead only by the skin of his teeth. Jeroen Kramscher once again, the Netherlands skier trying to hunt the Norwegian down. Enrique Plante, uh, just off the screen there for Argentina, but uh, sorry, to go back to the top three, it's Norway, Netherlands, Netherlands, then Japan in fourth, Italy in fifth. The names on those cards are Pedersen, Kramscher, De Langen, Taiki Mori and then Italy's Reni de Silvestro making up the top five. So we have a gap now until uh, FIS TV brings you continued live coverage of this giant slalom competition. Uh, we'll be back local time, that's Central European time, there's the graphic on screen. We'll be back at 1300 hours, 1 p.m. And for those of you joining us in the UK and in the GMT time zone, that's one hour earlier. For those of you, the rest of you joining us from all around the world, check your local world clock. <laughs> it's about 1300 Central European time. Make a note, don't miss it. It's going to be a nail biter. We have six different divisions across the men's and women's categories. Visually impaired, standing and sitting athletes. Each and every one of those categories is really closely contested so far from this morning's first run. My name's John Clark. I'm going to be back here, same place, in two hours from now. I hope you all make sure to join me. It's going to be a thriller as we do the concluding section of today's Giant Slalom competition. So thanks for your company from uh, Sela Nevea here. And uh, look forward to us all getting back in front of our screens in a couple of hours from now. We'll see you all then.